So we're talking about free um, communications and messaging. Um, today's session, I'm, I'm going to quickly go through some slides and some pictures. Um, I'm going to show how they relate to the Debian project, um, particularly um, the next release. Wheezy has some new um, some new features for voice over IP. Um, and then it's um, going to open up a little bit for some discussion and questions as well. Um, voice over IP goes beyond Debian itself. Um, is obviously you have to interoperate with um, with other systems. So I mean I'm keen on things like soft phones on Android. Um, I've worked on things that work on Windows as well. But the focus I of most of what you're going to see is on Debian. Um, so this is an outline of, of the session. Um, so just looking at the um, at where we are today and, and how we got there. Um, mail email has become tremendously successful. Everyone's using it. It's it's based on open standards um, like SMTP. So you can see that in the in the heading. Um, mail servers are installed by default in, in most Linux systems. I mean, in Debian, you, you get XIM, or, or you might swap that for Postfix. It used to be SendMail, but you'd always end up with one of them when you install um, a Linux system. That's probably been one of the reasons why email has taken hold, is because it's always been on systems from the beginning. Um, so a trivial amount of effort is necessary. You, you need a static IP address, an MX record. You can change maybe two or three lines of config file and, and start filling up your um, mailbox with spam that you, you never wanted. Um, <laughs> um, VoIP servers have not been deployed by default. Um, typically, um, they're not nearly as easy to configure either. So distributions that offer packages like, like Debian offers asterisk and um, still leaves a lot of setting up as well. So it's not installed by default. And if you go and get it with, with apt-get, you have to do a lot of the effort to set it up. It does come with a default configuration for a demo, um, but that has to be adapted. You can't just go live with that. Um, so the bottom line is that the free software and open standards have not become entrenched. We, we don't have a, an open source equivalent to, to Firefox in the, in the VoIP world. Um, so Asterisk you know, takes a lot of setup effort. I mean, I've got Asterisk systems with dozens of config files for um, every protocol for different classes of user and gateway connection and it's a real pain. Um, I haven't seen any um, voice over IP system that automatically gives VoIP to all the Unix users on a machine. Once again, the email servers will typically turn your Unix users into mailboxes, just out of the box. It's all automatic. Um, but none of the voice over IP pro uh, products have tried to do that. Um, there have been um, a number of legacy traditions like telephone numbering, um, and th these are important. Like on many devices, you don't have a full keyboard, so you, you do need to preserve these traditions. Um, but they have slowed down the adoption of new techniques. Um, another one is emergency dialing. Um, so depending on which country you're in, it might be 911 or 999 or 112 in, in Europe. Um, these things have all you know, been factors in the slow deployment of, of a universal VoIP infrastructure. Email never had to deal with things like this. There's no emergency you know, fax number in most countries. That it, Email never had to compete with something like that. Um, the two major protocols to choose from right at this moment, SIP and Jabba, and even that is a dilemma for people. Like Google has gone with Jabba, Microsoft has gone with SIP for, for some of their products. A lot of the physical desk phones are based on SIP um, without Jabba support. 
um, but Google is, is huge and they're Jabba. So, so both protocols are very relevant right now. The, there's no definite winner. Um, and NAT has been a huge headache, but people have often embarked on a VoIP project and, and ended up pulling their hair out because someone will take a VoIP phone into their house and their router will mangle the, the signaling packets or it will lose the audio in one direction. It's caused a lot of frustration. Email doesn't have those sort of headaches with uh, NAT. Um, so Skype and, and now more recently we've seen Viber have, um, have seized the day. They've, um, they've become very prominent. If you ask people about voice over IP, they will talk to you about Skype. Um, is there anyone here who has not used Skype? Yep. Okay. Now keep your hand up if, you, um, if no one has ever asked you to talk to them on Skype. Okay, so we've, we've all come across this. And, and we're going to touch on this again later, but there's a, there's a certain amount of peer pressure in, in communications that doesn't exist with, with other open source endeavours. Um, with free software, people won't worry about whether you're using Linux, but when you actually need to talk to them, you need to agree on a common platform. Um, In the corporate world, um, Microsoft Link is, is gaining traction. In many of the big corporates that I've been working with, I've seen Link projects getting underway. Um, I haven't seen one that has been successful yet, um, but that doesn't mean they've failed. It just means that they're taking their time um, and that at some point, you know, a lot of them are going to be stuck on this and people are going to see this as the default in, in the corporate world, like Outlook. Um, just wait, we need to get you the microphone. Is uh, Microsoft Link, is that uh, OCC? Is that uh, another name? So Office. just hold the microphone a is little. That Office, is Link Office Communicator? Yes, is it's had various names. In so you, you will notice that, that there are products like SIP phones that have been made for earlier versions of, of Link when it operated under another name. Um, and most of the SIP phones offer like compatibility features which are necessary because Microsoft makes extensions to the protocol. Um, another point to think about um, is who has seen the recent Facebook attack on email? on email addresses. So everyone know what I'm talking about? No? Um, that in um, contact lists, people typically have their, um, their friends' email addresses on Facebook um, and they have their own email address. Um, Facebook is trying to get people to use their Facebook ID as an email address at facebook.com. Um, and at some point recently they, um, they somehow switched off or hid um, the non-Facebook email addresses so that if you look at a profile um, you see the Facebook email address that you never knew you wanted um, but you've got it um, and you have to go in there manually and put back your own email address um, if you are a Facebook user. Um, on top of that I've read that the people who are running the Facebook app which integrates on their handheld devices um, got so excited about this that it actually modified their contact list outside of Facebook, but their, their phone contact list actually started picking up the Facebook email addresses and losing the other email addresses, which caused a lot of frustration. So, um, But you could see where these big companies are going with this. Um, you know, they want to standardise the the user on a particular ID and, and then they want to bring all the communications through that single ID for their various reasons and we, we'll look at those reasons in a moment. Um, but this is scary stuff and, and that Facebook example gives you a very, um, it's a wake up call about the lengths that they will go to to get hold of your communications. Um, 
So real world examples in other te domains in technology. You've got um, the encryption of DVDs. Um, you've got um, HDMI using DRM to protect media to stop duplication of media. Um, you've got secure boot coming to the PC um, to stop you running other software. Um, I mean, what can we anticipate next? Um, in voice over IP, with, with Skype so widely deployed and with Link getting a foothold in the corporate market, could we see a similar trend that DRM could come to voice over IP? Um, and, and how would that look if that happened? Well, the yeah. Is it already the case with Skype? Not quite. It is a proprietary and encrypted system, but it doesn't really link out to other systems very effectively. Um, they haven't so tightly bound it with Link. Um, but if Link becomes established in, your, say, your Fortune 500 companies, and they can all call each other through Link, and the member of the public wants to call a big you know, corporate call center or something, and they can do that for free through Skype, um, or maybe they will have to go to their traditional phone company and pay for that and there'll be no other option. That's the type of thing that, that we should be concerned about is that the, the market will be steered in this direction. A another way that they could steer the market is with things like emergency calling which is currently a bit difficult over the internet. That Each country has got to a different stage in trying to support emergency calls over voice over IP. Um, but if you look at the relationships of, of governments and big companies, um, you know, Microsoft may, or another vendor, may try to propose a proprietary protocol to solve that problem. Um, and that could be very dangerous to um, open and free um, protocols. So, so DRM-like mechanisms may extend the, um, the barriers that already exist with Skype. Um, so you may see a few big companies that agree to work together um, even more than they do now. At the moment they're like islands, like Viber and Skype are separate. But if, if a few of these companies stitch something up together um, using some sort of a DRM mechanism, um, then it becomes a lot more dangerous. Um, just about that, we have things, seen things, uh, proposal like that uh, to prioritize certain ty types of internet content to others with regards to others, like video should be have higher priority than text-based things. And if we see some stuff like Skype should be more prioritized than the rest, we are also in the same type of situation. Yes, there's a real risk that when you combine technologies like deep packet inspection, and so on, then an ISP could recognize Skype pra uh, packets and they could offer Microsoft a deal to prioritize their, their traffic on the network, which is another attack on, on freedom and choice of, of what product you use. Um, so, th th I mean, this list could go on and on, all the different ways that, that, um, that open and free solutions could, um, could be put in danger. Um, advertising has come up recently. There was some talk about Skype displaying um, advertisements during audio calls. So you would see an advertisement in the video window if you were not using video. Um, I don't know if it's already switched on, but it, it has been discussed publicly. Um, but it may not be in your face like that. They may actually use more sophisticated mechanisms, and I'm going to touch on those in a moment. Um, Corporates um, may be able to, to opt out of having advertising for their callers. So if you call your bank, um, you might not see advertising. You, you get the free call with a proprietary VoIP system, but you know, the bank might have a deal with the, um, the vendor to, um, to exclude advertising on those calls. Um, and calls between corporates. We, we don't know which way this is going to go now because it hasn't really taken off yet. Um, but there's a real danger that that could also 
depend heavily on, on Link, that if, if a lot of them start using Link, and a lot of governments as well, then, um, then people will not be able to make a credible case to use something else. Um, so if other solutions don't actually get in there first, um, and if these big boys get established, then it becomes a lot more dangerous. Um, they can't do that retrospectively with email now. I mean, we've had some fears about um, domain keys and other techniques that have that some companies have tried to introduce to email, um, but they haven't completely um, stopped open source and free solutions. Um, here, we're at a different point because the open and free solutions don't have a strong foothold yet. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, can everyone read that at the back? No? no? Okay. So what you can see here, um, down the bottom, that big bar basically represents your single sign-on, your say your Microsoft passport or your Facebook login, um, your cookies that follow you everywhere. Um, and what you've got in the big box on the left is your your soft phone, whatever that may be, um, your non-free product. And then these two little arrows, in the top arrow, we've got um, a system analysing your speech to, to extract the words. And these systems already exist, so they're extracting what you say um, in whatever language you choose to speak. Um, and the other arrow is analysing your emotions and other context. Um, and they can do this as well. They can detect whether you're happy or sad. If you're happy, you know, they want to sell you a holiday. If you're, if you're afraid, they'll try and sell you car insurance or something. Um, and this all goes into a data warehouse somewhere. Um, this then drives some logic for positioning advertisements. And on the right, you've got your, um, your web browsing and your other online activities, not just during the time that you're on a phone call, but maybe for the rest of the day or the rest of the week. Um, so they build up a picture of your state during a phone call and then they can use that to influence what advertising you'll see. Um, and they can link all of that together using a single sign-on and other mechanisms that track you. Um, so this is serious stuff because it allows advertisers to target things much more closely than ever before. Um, just to break out of that for a moment. So in the um, browser here, um, this is a publication from the uh, IEEE um, from 2006. Um, it's been around for about six years. Um, but this basically concerns um, ad analysing um, emotions in speech to understand how you react to different brands. Um, so you can imagine you know, that this is not the only application of this technology, but if you type this into Google, um, you know, recognition of emotions in speech, you'll find a lot of stuff has been done over quite a few years now. Um, so communications, um, it's very pervasive. E every person and every business has some sort of communication system, a, techno a technological solution, whether it's their mobile phone, their email, um, maybe a combination of things. Um, not only that, but they get a lot more angry if it's not working um, compared to just an outage of their um, internet browsing. But as I mentioned before, with a operating system, you don't have so much pressure from other people. I mean, I've worked in offices where I could use Linux, when, even though the guy sitting next to me was running Windows. Um, I've been able to use Thunderbird or iStove to connect to the Exchange server, even when the guy next to me is using Outlook. Um, but with communications, you have a bit more pressure 
to use something that's compatible. That's why we all get these requests to use Skype or it's typically Skype that people mention. Um, and and it, it's just a very dangerous area that if, if we fail to address the concerns about the quality of the service or if we fail to attack the, um, the, net, the peer pressure issue and to provide solutions that can be widespread, then, you know, then open source and free solutions just won't get a, f a foot in the door. Um, so what can we do? Um, so here I've got a list of some suggestions and, and I've mentioned some packages that already exist in, in Wheezy. Um, Supporting both protocols, the SIP and Jabber. Um, I think that if you choose one or the other, then you won't have 100% coverage. Um, so do we have some questions? A uh, microphone. microphone. I would like to add something before you go further. Um, I, I missed the first uh, slide, but I think you didn't talk about also the issue of the lack of encryption or at least end-to-end -end encryption that could guarantee that your communication is uh, protected and, and uh, confidential, which is, I think, is uh, more, much more worrisome than advertisement. Hmm. Yeah, encryption is an issue. It's not the fundamental issue of the, the talk today, but a lot of what we're going to go through does actually support it. And it is on this slide as well. It's further down. You'll see TLS is greyed out at the moment. Um, but we'll get to the encryption, the, the um, this little demo coming as well. Um, it is very relevant, but it's not um, fundamental to having the free solution. So OK, I mentioned this because recently I heard about Skype uh, integrating some technology to be able to make possible and easy to governments to wiretap calls. Yes, well, they already do that with, with GSM networks. I mean, most people have the perception that when they take out their mobile phone and they call their friend, um, so if I call Hector, I might believe that my call is encrypted all the way to his phone. Is that true? No? It's encrypted to the tower, and then the tower decrypts it, listens to it if, if necessary, and then encrypts it again and sends it out to his phone. So most people have the perception that it's encrypted from their phone to the phone that they're calling, um, that there's nothing in the middle. But that's, it's not true. Um, so, so just going back to the, um, the slide, so... SIP and Jabber in parallel. Um, we have another question. Microphone. Yeah. Um, so you didn't mention um, Mumble's protocols. Is that not relevant here as something that is in use and isn't either SIP or Jabber, as I understand it? It's not as widespread, but it is relevant. So, yeah. But what we'll do, is I'll, I'll go through, or do you, wanna, do you want me to stop for a minute and you can tell us it? No, we can go through a bit more detail for those who don't know. I'll let Bookie explain. Yeah, no, go, go ahead. I'll, well, I'll come back to that. Um, the other issue to maximise the chance that two people can speak to each other is to have as many codecs as possible. Um, that if if you have different codecs, and this is common with open source solutions, is many of them have the 64 kilobit codec, um, but they all have different low bit rate codecs. Some have GSM, some have speaks. Um, you actually need to have as many of them as possible to have success. Um, plug and play solutions, I mentioned before, you don't have that with asterisk. Um, but now we have packages like Repro, which is for SIP, and eJabberD has been around for a while. It's web-based, it's easy. You just install the package, um, do a few settings, and you have something you can use. Um, NAT, um, there is a solution now that the only requirement for, um, for ICE and TERM to work is that all your devices need to support it. Um, so as long as you can um, use like modern SIP phones or Jabber devices or soft phones, 
this will work. Um, it seems to be the only strong way to deal with the NAT issue. Um, and the package for that is this reciprocate turn server. Um, phone spam, I mean, if you imagine all the, the spam you get in email, who gets more than 10 spam messages in a day? Can, can you imagine if, if those were phone calls? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, this is a real issue and it's another reason that that voice over IP has been held back is this fear of spam, impersonation, um, as well as the interception of calls. Um, TLS with mutual authentication can address a lot of those problems um, because you know who's calling you um, because it's signed by a certificate. Um, and not only that, um, but you can implement access controls and other mechanisms. You can use statistical um, methods to identify patterns from spammers um, is they need to have some certificate to get on the network. You can recognize when, when they're using that certificate. Um, and legacy traditions like phone numbers. So enum is one way to address the requirement to keep using phone numbers or to support them. Um, this package, um, the DLZ LDAP enum, if you have phone numbers in a LDAP directory, it exposes them all over enum instantly. So any other voice over IP application that can use enum can use your LDAP directory for routing. Um, so that's a very quick win, installing that package. Um, this is just a, a quick diagram. Um, the main thing to notice here is that the two phones at the bottom right calling each other on the the local network, their RTP stream is going within the network between them. For the phone on the left, the one that's out on the internet somewhere, his RTP stream goes through that turn server at the top and that's how we deal with the NAT issue. And you notice in this case, if you can read the IP addresses, that the guy on the left actually has the same IP address on some other NAT as one of the phones in the office. Um, but for the turn server, that's no problem. Um, but it would be a problem with some older SIP solutions. Um, so if we go back and forth, you can see the Jabber solution is very, very similar. Um, but the Jabber system can also use um, the same turn server to, um, to handle the um, connection of NAT users. So, so that's, that's, all, that's another um, yeah, victory for open standards. You don't have to deploy two of these things. One of them is enough. Um, and this is putting them all together. You'll notice that the SIP server and the Jabber server, they can both use the same certificate as well. So you don't have to buy different certificates for each server. Um, and that's working with the, um, the single turn server for both of them. You have a soft phone using Jabber on the top left, and on the, the, um, sorry, the top right, and on the bottom right you have a desk phone using SIP. Um, and you have various users out in the wild. Um, so free software and, and free communications, they, they go together. Um, the DRM-like things, they're, they're a real threat. Um, so we're, we've already gone through half an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, skip over some of this and just go over here to um, the two quick demonstrations. This is the um, eJabberD server. Um, so it's a nice web interface. Um, after you install the package, you, you just go in and you add your users. You, you need to set up a certificate and start adding your users and then you've got a Jabber system and that's federated. So when you add your friend on Google Talk, they see your full domain with your email address uh, rather than a Google Talk user ID. Um, the other demonstration is um, 
repro the SIP proxy, which is very similar, but for SIP, um, that's not installed, and so we don't see anything here. Um, so we're going to see if, if it actually installs in the middle of giving a presentation without breaking something. So we install the... Um, um, yes, I can do that. Is that better? Is that better? Yep. Okay, so we've just installed the library package, this lib reciprocate, and we install the, um, let's install that turn server package. Um, that's installed. In the latest version of the packages, their um, config files have moved a little bit, but they're largely like this. So we just set up our IP address here, and then we have that turn server. You'll notice the um, default password here. I recommend changing that. So, <laughs> um, so this one, I'm actually going to remove that now, so, so you can all see my my host name there. Um, What was that package name? It's return. The actual package is not named return anymore. Is it? It wasn't appropriate for the archive. Um, so it's now reciprocate turn server. Um, but the other one is the repro proxy for SIP. Um, this one also has a config file. Um, you get to see some more passwords here. It's just admin um, is the default. And the port is 5080. So if we're lucky, we can log in as admin. We can add some users. We should add some domains first. My domain dot com. We just put that on the default port. Add a user. Um, so we put Daniel. And there it is. And if I successfully configure my um, phone, then it will appear on this list. Um, so th those are some of the quickest ways to get started with SIP and Jabber on Debian. Um, so those packages should be there in, in Wheezy, very much in the form that you've just seen. Um, just to look at it from another angle, um, this is the Bloomy Call dialer for Android. Um, And you can see here a demonstration of dialing with um, enum. Um, so we've selected a contact, and the, the dialer has actually found an enum record for Bob's phone number. So that's the first record you see with enum, um, is via sip5060.net. So it can place the call for free using that. The next option is it's found Bob's email address, which you see there. And it's realized that he has a SIP server for lumicall.org. And so it offers you the option of calling that email address as if it's a SIP address. Um, so it just works that out. If the domain doesn't have the SIP address, it won't, um, it won't show up as an option. So the user should not be confused. And then it can dial through the mobile network and you, you pay for the call. Um, I'll just let it continue. Um, so I've chosen the enum route. It dials the number. Um, and in this case, um, it's doing, um, it's warning us the call is not secure. And there it is. It's done the ZRTP um, setup and it's now secured. Um, those two words you see there. Both, in, both users on each end of the call should see the same two words. Um, the security of ZRTP 
is based on two things, that you should both see the same words and that you should um, recognise the other person's voice. So it doesn't work if you call you know, the airline and you get someone in a call centre who you've never spoken to before um, because you don't have any way to recognise their voice. Um, so ZRTP gives you these two words and if you hear the voice and you recognise it and they read out those two words to you, then you know you have a secure line. And it's based on a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, so that's Lumicall. Um, so that's, that's the end of the, the presentation. So I'd like to have questions. Yes. Uh, by security here, you mean security as in, um, um, as in I'm talking to who I would like to be talking to, or? Yes. Um, using the voice authentication, you're verifying the identity of the person. Um, and on top of that, it's also encrypting the call with AES. So all the packets are signed with a, a digest um, so that they're not, um, so there's no impersonation. And they're all encrypted with AI AES, so it's encrypted. Um, I would like to point out a couple of things uh, about the, the, the whole topic. Well, first of all, here I, I will say immediately that I don't think anybody will ever read those two words to anybody who they're calling. Uh, I don't think that's possible I mean, for real users. Uh, I think any solution that tries to do something like that is going to fail, to be honest. <laughs> but independently of that, um, you seem to be making the point that the problem, we, the problem we have currently with communications is based only on the difficulty of creating a SIP server, configuring it, etc. But I don't agree with that. I think uh, the biggest problem we have is, uh, first of all, that soft phones are in general not very good, that when people try a free soft phone, it will not work well, even though the, there is plenty of SIP providers give decent, decent products, uh, no sorry, different, de decent services. Uh, so I think the biggest issue to overcome is having really well working soft phones. And then also another thing, as I said before, the security concern, I think it's growing, it's growing in many people that is not technically ori oriented, <coughs> especially after what ha happened with Facebook and other stuff. So that's, I think is something that to concentrate on if we want to make those people switch to free software. But, but if, you are, if we are not putting this, the security and confidentiality as top priorities, I think you're not getting these people. And I see in your graphs, your RTP, your RTP connections were not secure. You were only caring about authentication. And I don't care about authentication. I care about uh, encryption. Okay. The, um, the diagrams that we looked at before were very simple. Um, so I, I didn't go into the SRTP simply because we don't have a lot of time to, to do that. Um, if you look at the opentelecoms.org website, you'll see it's covered in more depth. Um, the ZRTP itself, the, these two words and the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, um, they come from Phil Zimmerman, the guy behind um, the PGP. Um, so it is popular. This is just one implementation. It's, it's not something I created, and I don't take any credit for, I was for that protocol. So. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyhow, does anyone else have anything? I remember reading uh, once uh, some things that was saying that when you use Skype, uh, you are actually going through somebody who is running a Windows version of Skype and having set up his his or her computer well, so it's uh, not uh, nothing. I mean, it's, it's just has no firewall on their house. Uh, and uh, so in a sense, you get a good quality phone call because you are running in some sort of zombie network of Windows mm. users. So any thoughts on that? Uh, if I mean, sounds yes. bad. Yes, yes, this um, turn server does the same thing. It relays the packets for people who do not have um, 
real internet connectivity themselves who don't have a static IP address, they're behind a NAT, they cannot directly communicate with someone behind another NAT. So they need to relay their media somehow. Skype solved that problem by, as you described, acting like a Trojan. Um, if it discovered that some machine is open to the internet, it would turn that machine into a um, relay. Um, you have various consequences if the user switches off their machine or if they're downloading something, quality suffers. That's why deploying um, the return server package here um, builds much more solid solutions. Um, um, yeah, so I've been using a hard SIP phone for the last seven years or something, and that works pretty well with an external SIP provider. Um, but I could never get the soft phone stuff to work on my laptop until I got an N900, which actually makes phone calls that work. Mm -hmm. So I found the usual problem that you only got one-way comms or you couldn't get through the NAT thing and you end up using Skype to actually talk to somebody. Um, and are you saying that basically you reckon that is all now fixed and really will just work? Yeah. And, and also the second part before I show, is if I'm running your eJabber D server stuff, does that mean I don't now need an external SIP provider? except for the connecting to the PSTN part, is that? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, just to focus on that first, um, because that relates to the previous question about um, SIP providers as well, um, is that in the world of email, we don't rely on external email providers. We don't have a system of widespread use of email to fax gateways. I mean, they do exist, but they're not representing more than 1% of today's emails. <laughs> so in voice over IP, we still have a lot of reliance on, on SIP providers. Um, their business models vary, their quality varies. Um, most of them aim at a low cost market um, and that has consequences for customer support. It causes a lot of frustration for users who are very technical, who want to discuss a problem with an engineer because the SIP provider has a call center in um, the Philippines or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of frustrations there. The way around it is to build federated systems to just work around them. I mean, you still need to have some connectivity to the PSTN. Um, just a comment from IC. Um, apparently Skype no longer proxies through users' computers, and this is a recent change, apparently. So Skype. Yeah, there is a similar thing in, in Jabber as well called Jingle Nodes that attempts to do the same thing in an open way. But I won't go into that now. So, um, I have a couple questions. First of all, do you have any opinions about free switch? Uh, there is a now obsolete uh, ITP which has been closed. Uh, uh, it hasn't been worked on. Um, any thoughts about that? Um, uh, maybe I open that up to someone else. Okay, uh, I've been failing to package free switch for a very long time. Uh, I'm currently collaborating with someone that's uh, one of the free switch developers who has done most of the work that I did and a load of other work in parallel and a much better job because he understands the build system for free switch, which is a bit twisted to say the least. Uh, it, it includes things like wgetting libraries in the middle of the build, which is deeply beautiful. Um, so I think there's a reasonable chance of it getting packaged once we've done an audit of the copyright of the 150 odd libraries that they include. Uh, they seem to have a tendency to, whenever they see anything that could conceivably link against free switch, some cheerful person goes off and does it. Uh, they're starting to understand that um, that means that you end up with a lot of libraries that are three years out of date because they haven't got the manpower to keep on updating things. Maybe we will be able to get that as a Debian package, probably not with all those libraries intact. There is an instance of free switch running on void.debian.net at the moment, which we're also trying to get to the point where we can give all DDs uh, an account uh, normally I set that up as the way that you can make calls out of uh, DebConf. This year I ended up not having a, an operational hard phone, so that didn't happen. Uh, but hopefully 
this time round, we'll actually we've we've got bits in going into LDAP at the moment so that you can select a password for your login. Should be ready really soon. The server is running the new packages now. The new packages have some sort of sanity to them. Um, hopefully, that will all work. Uh, well, I'm going to say something that people that like Asterisk are going to get upset about now. But I'd say that free switch is to Asterisk what Postfix is to SendMail. Just, just to, because we, we have to wrap up now. But I, I have actually addressed this in detail on um, on the opentelecoms.org website, and so you can you can read this um, and find all the answers here. So, so thanks thanks for all the questions. Thanks for coming. Yep. Okay. Um.